Tim Shaw and welcome to my exhibition. And it was really the war in Iraq where I started to uh, create work about conflict. Such desolation. The casting of a dark democracy that I think stains our own democracy. Shape the society and shape the country in which we live. Tim, how are you, sir? Yes, very well. Thank you very much, Chris. Good, good. So we met uh, at the wonderful Martin Webster's film premiere for his film Penitent down there in um, in sunny Cornwall. And as I was saying to you before, Tim, I'm delighted to be able to chat to someone in an area I don't know an awful lot about, although as an author, um, I guess we're both artists. What would you term yourself, a, a sculptor? Or Yes, I would, I would, yeah. Yeah. I've heard the term visual artist uh, banded around. Is, is that something? Well, um, I, I am that as well. Um, but essentially, I'm a sculptor. And sort of traditionally, you know, that would be an artist that perhaps specialises in the shaping of, of um, three-dimensional form mm. in a bit material such as clay or wax or stone or... Um, but these days, it's, um, it's sort of... It can... It, it can be used as quite a wide in a wide in a wide way uh, term going into also installation as well and um, where light and sound is used and smell perhaps um, and Tim, how is it because I know the sheer amount of time it goes into creating well creating any anything of value um, I mean I've just made I've been making a a sheath knife with my son and it's, it's it's taken weeks in fact the whole process has gone into years now and i would imagine it there must be a point is there where it it, it starts to i mean you've got to get noticed to earn the money in order to be able to do the profession it mm. would, would i be right yeah, of course. Um, you know, we all need to to uh, to, to eat, and, and we need you know to live somewhere, and and so it, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't that doesn't come out of out of thin air um, unless you're extremely rich or whatever. Um, so for me, I do need to sell work and receive commissions in order to support what I what I do do and I'm lucky enough to be able to have that um, I work um, I do receive commissions and I, I do show and sell my work and in fact um, we're on the second last day of an exhibition which um, is on at the moment in St Ives and I'm a Monday so knives and my Monday gallery that is, and it's a show that's uh, called Fox and Balak, uh, which means clear the way. Yes, and and I'm guessing you need to earn a bit. You need to have a bit of money available because the materials with the the size of your s sculptings are quite significant. Yes. Um, I mean, I suppose yes. Bronze is not uh, having things produced in in, in bronze is, is definitely not uh, um, is definitely not cheap. Uh, quite the opposite. And um, but you know, I think as a sculptor, you can also um, you know you can use wood, which is readily available, um, branches. Um, you know, lots of different materials as well. Um, 
But whenever I'm making something, I try not to count the cost. And, you know, the idea of what, I, what it is I want to create becomes, the, you know, the bigger thing. And then, you know, finding the, the funding in order to do that, it kind of come, comes along. Hmm. Yes, got you. And so, Tim, you're born in Belfast, right at the. Um, you were born just before the trouble, so your your younger years would have been right in the in the thick of things. Yes, yes, the early seventies, I think, were, um, you know, looking back, <clears throat> quite crazy times actually, um, and I don't really. Yeah, I don't really have much memory, you know, from from before the troubles. I suppose I would have been six then, yeah, uh, when the nineteen seventy. I was born in nineteen sixty four, and um, yeah, early life memories really um, growing up in Belfast. Well, the army seemed to always be there, and in fact, when the army first arrived on the streets of Belfast. Um, yeah, we, we 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 lived in a Protestant area, and soldiers were welcome. And in the early days, in fact, our mothers would bring tea to the soldiers. And I remember jumping onto the, you know, the wagons and um, talking to the soldiers and you know. Um, playing with rubber bullets, <laughs> believe it or not, and um, and being given army badges from their hats and um, all of that. So, and then obviously, you know, when they, <clears throat> when it began to get very dangerous, I think the, you know, the, the it, it, it all became very separated and, you know, it, it probably wasn't a great thing to be close to a soldier because that was a target. Mm. But, uh, you know, I think at the time we, I think I think at the time we, we sort of had this inbuilt instinct that everything was okay. We were all safe. There weren't, there wasn't danger, but looking back at it, retrospectively it was a dangerous place to be it goes without saying because um, there were bomb explosions there were shootings and a lot in the early days in the in the early 70s and I remember as a kid being in the center of Belfast on a day called Bloody Friday which very few people, will have any knowledge of outside Northern Ireland. Um, many will know about Bloody Sunday, but on Bloody Friday, the IRA uh, planted 25 bombs, or close to, 19 of which went off um, within the city centre, <clears throat> or with, uh, certainly within, a, I think, a four-mile radius. Uh, 17 of those went off within the first 30 minutes, I, I believe, um, and certainly, um, you know, by, by 90 minutes, the 19 had gone off. So you can imagine what chaos and pandemonium that b brought to the streets and to the people of Belfast uh, that were shopping that day in the centre. And it, it was a case of, you know, running one way and not knowing whether you were running away from or into the next uh, bomb. And I think the IRA blamed the, said they, they had given warning to the security forces. But, you know, um, whatever warning you would have given, um, it would have no security forces or emergency services 
probably could have dealt with such a ferocity of, of bombing um, that day within such a, a short period of time. And very few people will know about that um, from outside Northern Ireland. And certainly, um, you know, younger people won't have any knowledge of that either. Do you, Tim, do you have a, a stance on, on conflict, on war, either personally or professionally? Uh, do I have a stance? Um, well, does your, does your work, is it, are you trying to, you know, put a message out there because it's the, the pieces that I've seen are obviously military or have mm. a military theme to them? Mm. Um, I guess I'm a realist um, in that conflict has been there from the beginning of time. And I think what I what my work hopefully does is it shows it shows what we do, shows what we are, and uh, with one particular piece called "Man on Fire," it's about the absolute horror of war, and I would like to think with that piece that we look at it and reflect. And um, we remember that when we go down the road of conflict, this is what is achieved. Nothing good comes from it. Mm. And if there's a way um, to, to stop something happening, then that is the path that should be taken. I mean, for instance, in Ukraine, you know, what good is coming from that? And it's the people at the top, Putin, for example, you know, this is all about him and his idea of what, um, of expansionism. And it's based on, you know, probably old fashioned ideas. We live in a world now, it, it's, the world is now too small um, for us to have these conflicts. You know, we, we need, humanity now needs to get on with saving the planet. And, mm. you know, these ideas of expansionism are just old fashioned and ridiculous. Yes. And the thing that, that was coming to mind when you're talking about your man on fire piece is that, it's not just an incident that you see on the news, is it? I mean, this is what your piece relates to, the, the chap on the tank that was set on fire. But it's affected you. It's to a degree affected me. It, the, everybody that's witnessed that incident through the media. But, of course, the soldiers concerned. It's not, it's not like a one-off thing, is it? This is... All these uh, is trauma embedded in people's mm. minds for the rest mm. of the rest of their lives. It's it's um yes, incredible. And I guess your work's helping to helping helping to highlight that. Yes, I think you know the the terrible thing is is with with conflict and you know it's the fallout that comes from that and the people that have seen seen dreadful things before they're in front of their very eyes. You can't unsee that. You know, you can't um, press rewind and, and take another path. Once you've seen something, um, you've seen it and you, and you can't obliterate, you can't obliterate, you have to, you have to deal with that. And I mean, my God, a lot of people um, at the moment, have seen dreadful things, and in, in the Ukraine, you know, well, I was going to say children and, and mothers, but anybody. Yes, exactly. And uh, yes, sorry. No, no, no. Continue. Yeah, you, you know, I'm a, I've a 
Radio 4 listener and um, I was listening a couple of weeks ago to, um, to our own correspondence or from, from our own correspondent, um, Kid Eddy, and uh, there was somebody out in Mariupol and, um, you know, this this they were just documenting this man had gone along a road and he hadn't realised until he sort of gone over a dead body that it was actually a dead body and, um, you know, it had sunk in the mud and it wasn't until afterwards that he, you know, thought he'd gone over a, some bit of rubble or something and it's just really dreadful, that. Did you study, um, did you go to art school, university? Yes, I did my foundation in Manchester at Manchester Polytechnic and then I, uh, then I did my degree at Falmouth School of Art mm. and then I left. I was hoping to go and do a, um, an MA in, in, in London at some stage, but I decided to, after I left college, I worked across southern England, uh, basing myself in Bristol, working on various restoration and con- conservation building, old building conservation projects. Um, I worked in Basingstoke and Kent and Chichester and several projects in and around um, Bristol as well. Um, but it wasn't too long before I realised that I really just needed to get on and make sculpture. And I gave that, that, that job up and um, I was lucky enough to find a gallery in London that would um, take on my work, show it and be, start to do cell work. Did you learn a lot about the profession when you were restoring items? Um, well, it was more, I had this idea when I left that I'd be working on medieval cathedrals and, and it wasn't, um, uh, it, it really wasn't that. It was more sort of restoring old buildings. There was a Tudor tower, a Folly tower, and um, a crucifixion that I also worked on. Um, so it wasn't particular. You know, I wasn't learning about the craft of sculpture really, and um, it was more sort of just re- restoring buildings. And when you started your studies, Tim. Did you know you wanted to be a sculptor or did you try your hand at, at different um, areas first? No, I've always been very single-minded there in that way. Um, when I was at school, I, yeah, it wasn't until I was about 14, 14 or 15. Um, yeah, I was probably one of those extremely annoy- annoying kids that was disruptive. <laughs> and... Uh, um, you know, always getting into trouble for not, you know, just very petty offences, let's say. But there was a, there was a, quite a lot of them. And, um, and one day, my art teacher said, uh, Tim, I would like you to work with some clay. And I thought, oh, great, this is another medium that I can throw around the classroom with people. And he said, you know, just, you know, just you know, just work away there. And I said, well, what, what do you want me to do with this? And he said, I don't know, you know, make, make some, make a head, make some hands. So I did literally that, sat down and, and started to, to create these forms, human forms. And um, pretty much straight away, I knew within that time, I connected with 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 the gift that I had and knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that's what I do. And there was never any question from that point onwards that this is what I would do. Um, as you can imagine, you know, growing up at that time in, well, I guess it would be anywhere, but uh, growing up at that time, particularly in Northern Ireland, where the artistic culture wasn't that great. 
um, you know, I was forever being told that, well, this is just a phase that you're going through or, you know, you're going to have to get a proper job one day. And so there was always that big challenge and question to get over, you know, how would I survive as an artist? And, um, and that made me all the more determined, really. And so, you know, when I went to art college in Man uh, Manchester Polytechnic and then on to art college here in Falmouth, I worked extremely hard and just always knew my vision was very clear as to what I would, would do. And it's pretty much remained so ever since that time. I'm now um, 57 and for many years now, I've just I made, every day I've made my sculpture. Is it, going back to Belfast, Tim, is it common knowledge in a community who paints these murals? Um, is it common knowledge what the, the, who the artist is? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question, and I can't answer that. Um, but, I, you know, imagine in, in, the, in the communities such as the Falls Roads, you know, na nationalist areas or Protestant areas such as the Shankill Road, where you see many of these murals, um, I'm sure in, in those communities the the it will be well known. You know, there'll there'll be some very gifted inv individual along one of those roads, and they're given the job of of being the muralist. Um, mm. You know, perhaps it wouldn't on a world stage it wouldn't be so sort of grand, but um, you know, certainly within those areas. There would have been a lot of time, um, you know, I guess, given over to thinking, you know, how they would be made and what, what they want to portray. And they're the very powerful um, pieces of, 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 of work. Pretty unique, aren't they, really? They're, they're, you, you don't really see such a political statement anywhere else in the world. Um, I, I might be wrong, but... Um, not, not in that sort of form anyway. Well, they're very, um, yes, they are, they're very direct. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things with growing up in, in Northern Ireland and, and, and at that time that, you know, as you know, communities were very divided. Um, you had your nationalist areas, you had your Protestant areas, and in the early days, those were very divided. Mm -hmm. And um, as a Protestant, you may not have felt very comfortable going into a nationalist area. And the demarcations were very clearly presented where I lived, um, not on my actual road, but not far away, you would have pavements, the, the actual um, pavements, which would, would, the curbs, which would have the colors, mm. red, white, and blue on them. Uh, you would have flags with the red hand of Ulster on it. And then obviously in the nationalist areas, green, white, and gold, and, um, uh, the, the tricolor, tricolor. Yes, for friends at home, um, kidnapping was a big, was a, a big problem, and uh, very often innocents were caught up in that too, weren't they? People coming back from the pub that got mistaken for for a for a gunman or something, and then they disappeared, only to turn up several days later later having been tortured and dead on the side of the road so yes i i don't know a great deal about that um and and i think that 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 you may but um yeah people did disappear i know that 
again, you know, we have this. I know, I know, for example, if I go home and the troubles aren't really talked about and you never really talked about them. And so it's taken a long time for me to sort of unravel what precisely it all was. But in there, there's murky memories of, um, you know, I remember looking up the road one day and seeing um, the whole wall of a house had disappeared <laughs> and um, and just you know, a disarray of a bed and you could see into the the bedroom and the living room and that whole wall had collapsed. I can't actually remember an explosion. And although probably where I lived, which was, you know, a fairly nice area, but probably within a, a quarter of a mile, there might have been maybe up to about 10 bombs that went off over time. But we never really discussed it. You know, I remember around the corner when the, when the library blew up because it, it, <laughs> I felt as if it nearly blew me out of bed. And then also the chap that lived opposite, not directly opposite, but one opposite and one house to the left was, was killed in his house. And... And the neighbours next door, who were a Catholic, young married Catholic couple had moved in. And the sooner had they moved in, that there was a trace of a, a bullet hole through the window. And they moved out pretty quickly thereafter. Um, so all, all those, those are murky memories. Um, but they have a residue and some tried to forget those things. And I guess as an artist, you recall them and you try to sort of give them, well, just, yeah, I, 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 I do, they're with me. They're, those things are with me. And there is a residue there. I remember, for example, recently, uh, when I was visiting home with my sister and, and nephews and nieces, we decided that we would go and have a walk on Divis, Divis Mountain, Black Mountain, which um, if I remember, Chris, you, you were posted to, to Belfast, weren't you? You'd spend time there. Yeah, I was actually part of my post and I was on Divis Mountain. There used to be a, uh, a little base up there. I can't yeah. even, to be honest, like, was it a Sanger or something was there? I just remember there's a, a small enclosure, lot just big enough to run around in the evening, but not not much bigger than that. Okay, so Divis Divis Mountain was um, was MOD, MOD land, so it was all cordoned off. It was um, you weren't allowed to nobody, you know, you, the public were not allowed to to walk um, on that mountain. So it was all cordoned off, and um, and it's where the British forces were. Um, so, and it's only in recent times that it's been opened up to the public. When I say recent, maybe in the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, although I could stand corrected to that, somebody else would be able to tell me exactly when. Um, and I thought, well, let, let's, let's, go and, let's go for a walk on that mountain because where I lived in North Belfast, you'd, it was quite close to that, that mountain. You'd see it off in the distance and you'd see the, um, the, the big communication um, towers there as well. Mm. So I was very interested to do that. And we took a road, I think it's called the High Town Road or somewhere close to there to, to get to that, to get to the Divis Mountain. I remember traveling along it and, just in talking about residue, just feeling, oh, this, this, this road feels, it's got a bad feeling about it. And I couldn't put my finger on what it was. And we turned 
a corner and there was a little memorial to three, three soldiers who'd been taken from a pub probably uh, and kidnapped and taken up there and, and, and executed. And all along that road is where actually they used to, you know, where the disappeared were, were buried, uh, which I was to learn afterwards. So it's funny how traveling along a road and it has that residue that you can sense and it's to do with the past. Yes, like a, a sort of dark energy. Yes, a dark energy. That's what that road had. And you could still feel it today. I'm interested to know how, after coming out of um, your studies, your career began. I mean, do, do you have to get yourself a workshop or do you, do you live? Do you, get, do you get a flat that's got you know, room, room to work in? Yeah, okay, so how did I start? Um, well, I was kind of fortunate in that, as I said before, that, you know, just after leaving art college, I went to work as a restorer, conservator of old buildings and sculpture. And I wasn't particularly happy doing that, or certainly, you know, seeing that as a, as a, a career that I would be, following for the rest of my, my professional life. And at that time, it was, you know, probably like every youngster, you would just think, oh, how do I get on the, on the right road here? And I remember my mother at the time saying, why don't you get in touch with this, uh, he was called Effie McWilliam, and he was um, probably one of Northern Ireland's best known sculptors who lived in London for, for most of his professional life. And my mother and I had vi vi visited the Ulster Museum back in 1982 or thereabouts to see a, a major solo show of his work. And I was fascinated by it. Um, there was a series called Women in Bomb Blast that he created and that was a very evocative and powerful, expressive. And those images stayed with me. And, and my mother had said, you know, get, get in contact with that man. And I said, well, I'm, you know, he's hardly going to um, respond to me. Anyway, in those days, you go to the library buy, and, and look at a book and find an artist's address, postal address. Mm -hmm. So I did write to him, thinking I'd never get a reply. But the following week, it did. And at that time, he was 82. I think he'd written, well, you know, I'm an old man now. Um, I don't know whether I'll be of much help to you or not, but come and visit me. So I did a date was set and I went to visit uh, Effie, as he was called, uh, at his house in Holland Park, London. And I was met at the door by him and came in and and we spent the next couple of hours just chatting away and, um, you know, he'd met people like Picasso. He'd spent time in, in Paris. And um, so he's very, very interesting. You know, he, he made me laugh when he said um, myself and William Scott, who is another um, Northern Irish, well, actually of Scottish descent, uh, but, but educated in Northern Ireland, they'd gone to the Slade, then headed to P Paris, as they put it, to be French. And I think a lot of people, a lot of art, young, young artists probably went to Paris to be French at that time. Anyway, he gave me a contact and he said, I, I want you to contact this man and tell him that I sent you. And I said cheerio to Effie McWilliam and got in contact with this chap who's called Mark Glazebrook, who ran the Albemarle Gallery in London, uh, right in the centre of London. I went to visit and um, 
at that. And he liked, he liked the work. He liked what I did. And then he sent me away with a check to say, get on with it now. And that's what I did. And I had my first solo show at the Albemarle Gallery. And get this, um, I wrote to Effie McWilliam a couple of years later just to thank him and to send him this invite. Um, and, you know, to say that, well, this happened as a result of, of meeting you. I'd like you to come to my exhibition. And he wrote back and said, I will come to your exhibition on one condition that you come to my exhibition the following day when it will open in the gallery just round the corner. And it was a nice little uh, uh, coincidence that, so he came to the show, I then went to his show, and sadly, a couple of months later, he died um, of, 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 of cancer. He had, hadn't been very well. but um, And then a gallery was opened in his honour in Banbridge, Northern Ireland, called the Effie McWilliam Gallery. And that's, that is where I had my first major public show uh, in 2015. Yes. Um we must give a thank you for all those artists out there that have helped a youngster come along because I had a similar thing when I wrote my first memoir and I realized how difficult it was to get one of these elusive publishing contracts. I thought, um, I thought, right, I'll take a different approach. I'll, I'll try and take the backdoor approach. And I wrote to about three authors and just introduced myself. Fortunately, we had e e email then, so it was a lot easier. And I just said, hi, my name's Chris. I've written my first memoir. Would you be kind enough to read the first couple of pages? And I phrased it like that as though, you know, can't be that hard to read two pages for somebody. And um there was a chap, I believe his name was Tim. He wrote a book called White Mischief. It was all about the history of cocaine. And he very kindly wrote back to me. And he gave me one bit of advice in that email that then allowed me to go and completely reshape or re reshape my writing. Um, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be be where where I am today or I certainly wouldn't have had enjoyed the successes that, uh, that I've enjoyed and the other chap or one of the other chaps that I wrote to said Chris this is amazing work I've spoken to my publisher and he wants to publish you immediately <laughs> I was like yes the uh the backdoor uh backdoor approach worked where were you creating your your works of art, Tim, at this at this stage. Well, listen. I'd, I would also like to say, Chris, that um, you know those the, those early years, which for me were the early nineties, really. So I I graduated in nineteen eighty nine, and then it's really in the early nineties that um, you know you're trying to sort of form your way, and that's why I came back to Cornwall um, because uh, I was able to come back to. To, to a farm where I had rented a room um, during my uh, during my student days the last the last year I was able to come back and um, use one of the barns as a studio and it was able to live work um, you know in a in a relatively inexpensive way as opposed to trying to do that in London um, and I'm still here today. On this farm, um, I've got a few studios now. <laughs> um, I haven't just stayed here. I did have time in London and Germany and gone on various residencies across Europe. Um, but I always come back to here. And I think that was a key um, to, to being able to do what I do, to keep you know, the exp expenses as, as, as low living and studio expenses as low as it could be. There is a drawback to that, and that's 
that you're 300 miles from London where, you know, the sort of the machinery and the networking of career building does go on. So you have to mm. go to the city to, to meet the people that you need to meet and, um, you know, deal, if that's where you, 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 you exhibit and people see your work. Not saying that that doesn't happen in, in other places too, but um, I've always felt that that I've needed to to show in London and and meet the people that I need to. And so, uh, as I said, during those those former years spent here, just working away in the studio, did a little little bit of teaching, found with uh, School of Art, which became found with University. And um, just really, you know, had, had my head to the grindstone on that and just carved away, really. As I was saying earlier, I had my first solo show in 1992. God, that is a long time ago. <laughs> and then I had another one in 95 and 97 in London. And I began to see that I was able to sell work and you know, had followers. And then um, I guess the momentum built. Uh, then I was, I did a show at Falmouth Gallery and and from that came a pretty major um, commission from the Eden Project, which I worked on from 2000 to 2004. And then that sort of amplified the work. It put it on a on a stage uh, whereby a million people or so would see it every year. And um, then I began to show with a gallery down here called Goldfish, that then became Millennium, and then became Anima Mundi. Uh, um, we've worked with its director called Joseph Clark. Um, who's been a great supporter. And then I, uh, I had a residency, a fellowship at the Kenneth Armitage Foundation um, where I had a wonderful supporter uh, called Michael Sandel, um, who was instrumental in that. And, and that began to put the work on a London stage, and things grew from that, really. Tim, what was the um, incident that happened? Was it Silencius? Is that, am I pronouncing it right? Salinas. Salinas, sorry. Yes. So Salinas was the... Um, okay, that came from the, the rights of Dionysus, uh, which is the commission that... Um, that the Eden Project commissioned me. Um, I was asked by the Eden Project, would I uh, create a piece that would tell the story about wine production or something to do with wine? And I thought, well, here's a good um, opportunity to to go back to the beginnings and let's work with um, on the subject of of uh, Dionysus the the um, god of the vines or the vine or grapes or nature god really and it, it that that Salinas was the tutor of Dionysus commonly depicted as this um, sort of large squat figure uh, and I decided to create this figure uh, with antlers um, because the Dionysian rites are all about fertility, really, as well. Um, so I produced this piece, this uh, Salinas piece, that was um, kind of very shaped by these depictions, depictions of Salinas from classical Greece, with this figure with a, an erect penis, and so this figure that I created was about eight foot high. Now that actually came after uh, a residency that I 
one at the British School at Athens um, and where I went off to do research in, in many of the Greek, in, in ancient Greek sites. So that piece came, came after, came out of that. And so I created, as I said, I created this figure in foam uh, with wooden, wooden antlers, uh, which I first showed at Goldfish and then Goldfish took this show to to London, to the east end of London in a place called Viner Street. Uh, this was around 2007. No, two that, yes, 2007. I think 2007 they did a show there. Viner Street at that time was a was um, quite a, a trendy street in which um, a good many gal, young galleries were, were, were opening up. So there's quite a, a nice, um, there's quite a lot of excitement, you know, private views when they were on the whole place, would, the whole street was crowded full of um, art followers and gallery people and all sorts. Anyway, I showed this piece there in the, in the yard and um, behind doors, actually, and one of the days, this chap came in, hooded chap with a baseball bat, and smashed into, it, smashed it um, up into bits, and then I believe left saying that I was worshiping the wrong god. <laughs> I wasn't there at the time. It was this poor gallery person behind the desk that, that uh, witnessed this was, must have been quite traumatic for her, I'd imagine. Mm. Um, yeah, and then it, it arrived in the, the following day or the next day or two, it arrived in the, it was a double page spread in the, in the paper about it, um, connected to an article about art and vandalism. I'm guessing, had he... Had he assumed it was the devil or something? Uh, I, I really, really don't know. Um, you know, was it somebody that was psychotic? Was it somebody with very extreme religious beliefs? Could it have been another artist carrying out an art performance? <laughs> Um, I think several people said, oh, is this something that I had done to get, uh, was this a publicity stunt that I, myself and the gallery had pulled off? And certainly not because the piece had been collected by um, a, a very a major art collector. Mm. who were, And they, they weren't very happy about what had happened. Yes, I bet. And can you tell us about um, your military pieces, Tim, or the military-related ones? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the military, well, let, let's, let, I think let's call them the, the conflict or the pieces that, that are about conflict and war. Um, I think that all evolved out of when I was working on, on the Eden project and working on, on the Dion, about the Dionysian myths. And I created this, this, this piece, I think it was of Orpheus and it was a fact, sacrificial piece where um, in, in classical literature, Orpheus's head is ripped up from his body by the Mayanids, who are the followers of Dionysus. And I decided that I would produce, put his head on a, on a, on a pike and surrounded by seven hares' heads, also on pikes. So I wanted to, in other words, I wanted to produce this um, sacrificial scene and the Mayanids 
you know, it was alleged that they would go into the mountains and drink wine and, and become intoxicated and had this superhuman strength where they would rip animals apart and indeed some would sacrifice humans as well. Um, so that's why I created this scene. But it, I, when I was making this, um, and when I put the, the first head on the on, on a pike, it was actually around the time of the first beheading in Iraq. Um, I actually had the heads was telling a completely different story, but the timing was um, well. It was just at this time, and and the heads had to be. Take, there was a, a lot of complaints were made about this, um, so the head had to be taken out because visitors weren't very happy about that. But it it started to make me very aware of when law and order breaks down and we become intoxicated by, by conflict and war, that, that humanity starts to break down. And obviously, 2000 in early 2000s, from there onwards, you have the beginning of the, the war in Iraq and... Um, this is what you were saying on, you know, where a country was invaded and um, society was breaking down, um, you know, being ripped apart is, is probably a better way of saying it. Mm -hmm. And so I started to become conscious of war really from that point. Mm -hmm. And also I think at that time I hadn't really, I'd never made work about Northern Ireland. I'd always shied away from it. And, you know, people used to say, well, you know, why, why haven't you made work about, about where you grew up and conflict? And I didn't want to. And, and it was really the war in Iraq where I started to uh, create work about conflict and um, and it wasn't until, well, the first piece that I created was called Casting a Dark Democracy. And it was based on the uh, very infamous um, photograph that were the, of the hooded Abu Ghraib figure, mm. and you, we all, which we'll all, all know. And it's when the the Marines, the U.S. Marines, had um, put a prisoner who was cloaked in a, a blanket. I think he would have been naked, and then he, he was cloaked in a a blanket, put on a probably uh, I'd say a box of um, some some box, and mm. with a hood over his head. And he was given these electrical wires to hold. And I think he may have been told that if he, if he fell off the box, he would fall into water and be electrocuted. Anyway, the image, when I first saw that image, it had such a powerful resonance. And you looked at it and thought, where does this come from? What time does this come from? It looked like something that had been dug out of the ground um, from long ago. It looked medieval in, apparent, in, in appearance. And yet, these were the images that had just come to light um, in 2004. Oh, these, these torture scenes. And that was just one of many photographs that were taken. But it was that image that for me, really told, told the story of a, of a war that was just seemed at best controversial and at worst illegal. And to this day, 
it seems it seems controversial and you know i just felt that you know we should not have invaded iraq and so what i did do is i created um the piece that you see there based on that image i created um uh, at a height of 5.5 meters but 18 foot in height on a on a wooden plinth um the figure itself is made from steel barbed wire and black agricultural plastic is stretched over it in the shape of that figure and then it overlooks a pool of oil the first version of it is an elongated shadow if you like um of the figure itself and that represents really it's it's the casting of a dark democracy that i think stains our own democracy uh and of course you know we now know that um there were no weapon weapons of mass destruction aimed at us yes and even if they were you know smashing a modern civilized country into back into the stone age isn't the way that we we need to do things is it yes i'm not you know i think that saddam hussein was a dictator and a terrible man um but did that constitute us going in and blowing the place apart i know what i think <laughs> Yes. Tim, um, two more things for you. Do, did you want to talk about, um, was it Man on Fire? I'm, I'm just looking at some pictures as we're... Um, um, it, it's up to you how much, because of what, what you said to me out earlier, I know there's stuff that you can't divulge, mm. um, but did you want to t talk about it at all? Yes, um, so Man on Fire, um, you, you'll remember that in 2005, there were these very visceral, horrible images of, um, uh, that were posted across the press of a riot scene in Basra, and it had these soldiers that were clambering out of a APC warrior. Um, and in the riot, petrol bombs had been thrown at the warrior car. And I think one had gone right into the, into the actual vehicle. And God, uh, what an awful thing that must have been. Um, setting the whole sort of inside of the warrior vehicle on fire. And out of the hatch came these soldiers on fire, jumping from the, 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 the warrior. And I remember just looking at these images and thinking, good God, you know, this is this is this is what this is the true reality and the true cost of the horror of war. This is what it this is what war is about. And just seeing this soldier diving from the tank um, on fire. And so I produced this piece called Tank on Fire. And um, just really, just showing that image, I guess. And then I created from there, um, from some other photographs that were related to that, that particular event. Um, you know, soldiers running on fire. And I just wanted to create this piece that also, I've got to say that roughly at, at that time, well, a couple of years on, uh, 2000, 2007, I think, um, was, the, was the terrorist attack on Glasgow Airport, where we saw the two terrorists um, who'd, who'd crashed into the, tried to crash into the airport um, with um, 
well, trying to blow up the airport. And one of them had got, was pictured sort of running from the car and on fire. And it's that famous scene of, of somebody with a fire extinguisher trying to put him out, put the fire out. And I don't know, the, the, these images, that image, as well as the, with the ones taken from, from Basra, 2005, um, it just had a real resonance for me. Um, it, it just didn't leave my mind and I just needed to make it, make these, um, make these pieces tank on fire and man on fire. Um, why? I don't know. It's, you know, I, I suppose as a kid, I often saw vehicles burnt out and scenes after a riot and, um, you know, looking at a building after it had been burnt out or an explosion. I don't know, the, the, the mind and the imagination fill it, fills in what the eyes haven't seen. And with those images, um, I guess it, it really disturbed me. And it made me think about, you know, the, I guess this this person alive uh, that has been consumed by flames, grasping on to life and in a, on a precipice, lunging forward with, with arms outstretched, trying to grasp on to life uh, with death consuming him or her. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's very disturbing. And I don't know, I needed to make it. I need, needed to make that, that piece. Um, and so I created a small version of it, first of all. Well, first of all, I made Tank on Fire. And then I made this version of Man on Fire and put it on a white pedestal and wrote on the pedestal what God of love inspired Bars such hatred in the hearts of men and I poured oil over it and I think it was a comment on at that time about how religion fuels people to go to war but in fact the real war is about is about loss and gain of land and power and that being oil as well control of oil and that becomes the real God. And yes, uh, none more so than at, at, at this moment in time. Yeah. And so I decided to create, I thought, after I'd made that piece, I thought I really need to make this a big, larger version of this. So I created Man on Fire in 2000 and spring 2009 uh, it was the next piece I made after casting a dark democracy and I don't know why I just, I just decided to to create it at a, at a monumental scale and then I um, I finished my fellowship in in London and it got shown a few times um, 2014. 2018 in, in public shows across the UK and an opportunity came up where this piece could be cast into bronze and for the purposes of, of, of it being um, gifted to the state. And it is in the process of now being cast into bronze and it will be installed next year uh, in front of a museum. I shan't say where. And uh, it's about five metres tall now and four and a half metres long. So it's a, quite a monumental piece. And I reworked it uh, during lockdown for a whole year 
because it's when I, when I originally created the piece, it was designed for it to be shown running across the gallery floor. And now it will be, uh, because it's going to be out in the public domain, it needs to be on a pedestal. So you'll be able to walk up to it and, you know, see underneath it. And, um, and well, what is it about? It's, it's about the horror of war and the true cost of war. I really can't say more than that. Mm. Well, congratulations on the commission. And um, Tim, just the last thing, just of interest to me really, is the whole green man thing. Mm. I wasn't aware of the green man until that, um, was it True Detective with Matthew McConaughey? And it started, this notion of a green man started to, sort of come into my life at least. And then I realise there's, there's an awful lot of history behind it. Mm. Listen, Chris, I'll come to that in a sec, but there's something probably quite important that I've left out here that I'm just <laughs> thinking about it now. There's a piece called Mother There Is Blue, There Is Dangerous. Um, and you'll, you might see it there on, on my website. Um, it's of a blue room. And I'm bringing it up because I suppose it ties together quite a lot of what I do. And it's quite an interesting story as well about memory. Um, now, I've said that I was in Belfast during Bloody Friday, but there's this other event, and I've never been able to make total sense of it, but there's a memory of being in a restaurant. Well, it was a canteen. You didn't really have restaurants. <laughs> the early 70s in Belfast, <laughs> the idea of a restaurant may not have really existed, but it was in a, probably a sort of a cafe, cafe area um, in, a, in a store, department store. And I remember... So I have this memory of um, my mother saying, get, get, yeah, get ready, we're going to go to town. And I remember playing with this little car, a uh, little dinky, you know, we had these little dinky cars, if you can remember them, or matchbox cars. And as soon as she said that, this awful, awful churning feeling began in my stomach. And I just remember thinking something horrible is going to happen today. And I didn't want to go to town. And my mother said, just get yourself together. And we're going off to town. And we went to that, we went to meet her friend and her son, her son being a lifelong friend of mine. Um, and we, we met them in the cafe. A bomb went off fairly nearby. And I remember freezing to the chair. I remember what I was eating. I remember what I was putting in my mouth at that moment. It was a tomato. I were, I were eating salad. Then another one goes off closer. And the fear that I had in me was dreadful because I just thought I wasn't sure if we were going to live out this moment. And then a really massive explosion happens. Um, and then this, it was almost that the air expanded and then just blew forward. And it was like an electric or a petrol blue color. This, the air was just like a petrol blue color and smoke started coming up the stairs and things went flying through the air. I remember the clatter of trays and, and panic set in and people ran one way and then another and we finally got out and 
I think my mother and I walked home that day through the streets. There's a lot of panic. And it was never really spoken about. Um, and I mentioned it many years later. And my mother said, oh, yes, I remember this, this thing. But many things happened. You know, it was a time when um, every day there were bombings and shootings. And it wasn't until I created Man on, uh, Man on Fire and Casting a Dark Democracy, in other words, the, the work that came from Iraq, and somebody said to me, what will I make next? And I thought I need to keep, give shape and form to this memory. And an opportunity came up in Greece to go and, and uh, do a residency. It was at the Capatos Gallery in Athens. And before I left for, for Athens, um, I went back to Belfast, as I would do every summer, uh, to see my folks and friends. And I said to my friend, whose name I won't, I won't mention, um, the lifelong friend that was there that day, we were out in a pub, um, half a dozen of mates, and I turned to him and I said, I'm going to make this piece of work about this memory that I have and I said, do you remember being in this restaurant when a bomb goes off nearby? And he just froze and look, looked at me, looked blank and said no. And at that moment, I thought, well, let's move the moment on. Let's get, carry on. Pints, who's the next round, whatever. And I, le I left for Greece soon after. And I thought, this is problematic. Where does this memory sit, now sit? And um, my mother's dead, so she wouldn't be able to back this up. Nevertheless, it's something that I've carried all my life. Um, just, it's just there. I said earlier to you that once you've seen something you can't unsee it you can't rewind memory and um but the person that was there that is alive today didn't appear to remember so i carried on uh with this piece that became an installation um based on that memory and in the installation there's chairs and tables and clothes, or sorry, the chairs, tables, um, the sort of detritus that you might find of left in a panic situation of coats, handbags, you know, when it, something like that happened, you have no time to, to get your handbag and pick it up and take it, or I imagine so. And the, there is just this sound um, a strange sounds of, you could say, sort of based on a sarin, almost. Um, and on the walls are projected these figures running, running to the door, continually running, just shadows. Because what I remember is not people, but almost people as grey shadows, shadows, faded shadows, running in panic and running like panicked animals one way and then another. Mm. So I produced this piece and I, the opportunity to show it in Northern Ireland at the F.E. McWilliam Gallery came up and they wanted to show the piece. And 2015 is still would be a time when showing that would still be quite controversial because it would, you know, it would rise many memories in, in people's minds. And indeed, uh, my cousin's husband had to leave the gallery. Anyway, my friends came, as well as some of my other friends, and 
I felt very uncomfortable about it because I'd had to sort of um, cut him out of the history of the, the making of the work because um, he didn't appear to remember it. Mm. And I didn't say much. I didn't actually, I wasn't able to talk to him that night. Um, but if, the next day I phoned and said, thanks for coming to the show. And he said, Tim, I walked into that room and I saw hell. And it brought back this early childhood memory of being in a restaurant with my mother. And we run and we get out and we looked up at the window and there's all these flames coming out pretty much close to where we sat. And because I'd got things so mixed up in my mind about him um, not remembering, I th- had sort of these distorted thoughts of, is he just trying to, um, is he played a trick on me or whatever? So I said, I need to see you straight away. Um, and we met in a pub the following hour. And I, I, I didn't, I just couldn't trust what he was saying until he drew it out. And I said, you, you must draw this out. You must draw a diagram of this and point out where you were sitting and, you know, tell me more about this, what, what you saw and felt. And he sort of wondered why I was um, making him do this, but he did it. And, and then I said to him, we were both there together and he couldn't remember me or my mother, but all he could remember was the lunch and his mother and running with his mother. And I think what an extraordinary thing to not remember such an event that I could remember until the moment he walked into that room and then this memory came to light in his mind. It, it, it really fascinated me because when I told him about what I was going to make, the look in his eye was, it was as if it had gone dead. It was a stare, but it was a hollow stare. Mm. And that's why I moved on. I didn't want to breach the subject. It was like I wanted to move on from that moment straight away. And you know, I thought, well, I'll, I'll cut him out. I'll cut him out of this story. And then meeting him the next day or talking to him on the phone when he said, I walked into that room and it was like walking into hell. And then he said, it reminds me of this. I remember this thing that happened when I was a kid. And I guess all you can say from that is that I guess the person that you're closest to, your mother, becomes the main thing that you remember. That's your safety. And all everything else is excluded. There we go. Yes, I, I wrote a piece once about the first time I ever went um, raving or, or party in a dance party, and I should say. And, and I could have sworn the guy in the car next to me was this chap called Steve. And when we hooked up years later, having not seen each other for a while, I said, Steve, you got to read this. And I sent it to him. <laughs> And I was waiting for his response to be, wow. And he said, no, nah, it wasn't me. <laughs> and, it, and then I remembered, oh, my God, no, it wasn't him, was it? It was, it was another chap. And people are funny. My dad once said to me, as an adult, or obviously I was an adult, he said, yeah, one time I was taking the cricket nets in. He's talking about being at school, right? He said, and yeah, this pilot ejected from his plane. His chute didn't open. 
So he said, I just heard it. And he said, I looked over and he just died on the ground next to me. And I was like, dad, you didn't think to like mention that my whole life. And then what it was, he, the school was next to a military, uh, you know, must have been next to a R- RAF base and this pilot had taken off. I guess he had engine failure and didn't have enough altitude to turn around. So he had to, had to eject, shoot. I think they call it a Roman candle where you shoot mm. twists up. I, there's no, there's now so strange as folk mm. <laughs> that, that my whole life, my dad hadn't never thought to like mention that, that what was probably a severely traumatic injury. And then that led to me thinking, bloody hell, what must be going on in my dad's head to, in his own life for that to be insignificant. And I'm, I can sort of tell you, there's probably quite a lot of other stuff going on that, that meant that that, that wasn't sort of a thing for, for him. Well, I guess time moves on and you, you bury things. Uh, Chris, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to say, I've got a meeting in three minutes. I've got somebody turning up, um, but I'm very happy to carry this on at, um, um, another point. Yes. You must tell us after your um, installation, you must come and tell us how it, how it went and what the reception's like. This is the, um, are we, we're talking about the burning. Yeah. The, the man on fire. Yeah. I think that's a good point to also talk about the green man and, mm. um, and that takes it on to another section. So really happy to do that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that, um, I just, I, I have to meet the filmmaker actually, that's going to be recording it. Um, and he's due to, to arrive here in, in two minutes. Um, so um, I'm sorry to, to, no, to no, no, don't be sorry at all. Thank you so much, Tim, for sharing your, your life and your career with us. I'm, I'm just sat here finding it absolutely fascinating. So thank you. Yeah. I think, you know, I'm sorry to bring that up at the end, but the, um, you know, the, that, that, early childhood experience, but I think it probably also feeds in to the man on fire thing. It's, you know, I said earlier about, you know, what you don't see, your mind and your imagination fills in what might, or what could mm-hmm. happen or might have happened or did happen. And it's an er- interesting area, I think, that to, to, to deal with, I guess Martin. Webster deals with things like that. Tim, you must get off. Don't don't yeah. stay on the line. I'm just going to thank everybody at home for um, tuning into this one. Much love to you all, friends. Please look after yourself. If you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we will see you next time. Thank you very much. Same to you, Chris. Cheers, Tim. To you. Cheers, Bye-bye. Tim. Take care. Bye-bye.